Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for the Bible study today. We thank you because you have preserved us so that we can keep on listening to you and walking in the path of righteousness. And we're asking that as we come here today, you'll give us listening hearts and obedient hearts in Jesus' name. We pray that you give us the spirit of understanding. And we pray that your word will do good in every life in Jesus' name. We pray that you'll keep us alert and keep us awake so that we'll understand the word you are sending to every one of us. Thank you for the answer, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We come once again to study the word of God together today. As you know, the study of the word is very important for every believer. It's the study of the word that gives us backbone to our conviction. And it is the study of the word that makes us strong in the things of the Lord. And the study of the word has an important place in the life of every believer. As we have begun the new year, I have deliberately selected some special studies before we get back into the epistle to the Hebrews. And all these studies are leading us uh, to a point where we'll be able to serve the Lord and the mighty blessings of the Lord will be upon our lives. As you know, the Bible has the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament, uh, many times, the believers do not fully understand the study or the application of the Old Testament passages to the lives of the believers today. There are believers that do not have any understanding of the Old Testament that they keep on only reading the New Testament. They do not gather too much from the Old Testament. But the New Testament itself tells us how important the Old Testament is. In Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For what things were reaching at four time were reaching for our learning. That's talking about things that were written before the New Testament time. The things that were written before the coming of Christ. That is the Old Testament. All the things that are written there are written for our learning. That we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What is called the scriptures there is the Old Testament scripture. That the study of the Old Testament will lead us into a life of patience into the comfort of the Spirit of God and into the hope of failing hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10 11. Now all these things happened unto them for our examples and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That verse of scripture is telling us that until the end of time, the end of the world, we should keep on studying the examples of those Old Testament characters. That those things in the Old Testament are written for our admonition. That means for our instruction, our counseling, our admonition, our teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That means from the Old Testament writings, we also have doctrine, we have reproof, we have correction, we have instruction in righteousness. An important passage we are studying today is found in 1 Kings chapter 13. As we look at this chapter of the Old Testament, there are some men that come out very clearly to give us some important lessons. As you look at the large church today, you can divide the church into three groups or three categories. And there are three men you find in this passage we're going to study, each man representing the large society or the large community of the Christian church. And as we study this chapter of the scripture, you begin to identify with one of these people. These three men you will see, they are the commission from the Lord. As everyone, every man, every woman in the church has a commission from the Lord. These men were called upon to fulfill the will of God and to obey the word of God. Looking at them, it will appear they had special responsibility. They were selected men. 
As you look at the Bible at large, you'll find special, specially selected men like kings, like priests, like prophets, like pastors, like evangelists. And yet, even though you may not be a king, you may not be a prophet, you may not be a pastor, you may not be an evangelist, there is a special assignment God has for each of us. Unfortunately, there are many people that act like spectators in the world. They watch others, they admire their courage, they admire their faithfulness, while they themselves are sealing their leaves, folding their hands, sitting down, just idle. In this passage, we see, number one, a king. Number two, we see a young prophet. Number three, we see an old prophet. The king's name is Jeroboam. He had been given a special privilege or a special position. What he received from the Lord was simply by the grace of God. He was a servant lifted up to the position of a king. It wasn't by marriage. It was only by the unmerited favor of God which we call the grace of God. In 1 Kings chapter 11, reading from verse 28. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the, man, the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of his house of um, Joseph. He started in a very small way as a servant. He was very hardworking, very obedient, very cooperative, very submissive, and was very industrious. As Solomon the king saw all these qualities in this servant, then he made him ruler over the house of Joseph. Not only that Solomon promoted him, God sent the prophet Ahijah unto him. Look at verse 30. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said unto Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will rent the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give thee ten tribes. All that he had by the grace of God, not by marriage. And the Lord now told him, if he will continue to walk in the way of the Lord, more blessings will come upon his life. Verse 38. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and will walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David and give Israel unto thee. So prophet Ahijah saw him and he ran the garment in twelve parts and gave him ten, symbolizing that he will reign over ten tribes of Israel. Out of twelve, he got that as a servant promoted to the point of a king. Eventually, God moved the hearts of all the children of Israel to lift up Jeroboam and to confirm that prophecy and to make him king. Chapter 12, verse 20. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that the saint and called him unto the congregation, and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So this is how Jeroboam became a king over uh, the part of Israel that had the ten tribes, and he began to reign over them. But very soon Jeroboam backslid. What made him to backslide? He thought of the kingdom that had been given unto him. He wanted to keep that privilege and that position. He forgot he got it from the Lord free without anything, any merit of his life. He went into what is called self-management, wanting to see what to do by himself so that the kingdom will remain with him. So he developed a particular strategy. He made a particular announcement. He told the people that going to Jerusalem to worship will take them a long time. Therefore, they should remain where they were and then he set up idols for them. Chapter 12, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. What the Lord had given him by grace free of charge, he wanted to keep by a selfish, human, carnal, wicked, sinful method. He forgot that he didn't ask anything from the Lord. God just looked at him and blessed him and gave him the privilege of ruling over the people. Verse 27. If these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, 
Then shall the heart of these people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam the king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam the king of Judah. Wherefore the king took counsel and made two cows of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, thy God so Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. He adopts a process or principle of deceit or lying, so as to deceive the people and make them remain where they were, rather than going to the place where God had put his name, that the children of Israel shall appear and go to worship. He began to tell them, it's too much for you, it's too much labor. It's too much travail. It's too much difficulty. Traveling all the way to the headquarters, to Jerusalem, to worship. Why don't you stay here? Behold your God, so Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 29, And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, and even unto Dan. So that's the background of what we're studying today. Jeroboam led the children of Israel into idol worship and now God sent a man of God from Judah to warn him of what will take place. The warning could lead him to repentance but unfortunately Jeroboam did not repent. There are four points we are going to consider in the chapter we are studying today. Number one, prophecy against a backsliding idolatrous king. Number two, power and purity of a faithful prophet. Number three, perversions of a false deceptive prophet. Number four, the punishment of, for the disobedient prophet. Let's look at chapter 13 verse 1. And see the prophecy against this Jeroboam, the backsliding idolatrous king. From verse 1, and behold, there came a man of God out of Judah, and by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now you will see this uh, prophet came to uh, Bethel uh, so that he can warn and so that he can prophesy against Jeroboam the king because of the idol worship. Jeroboam himself now had even started burning the incense. He didn't just leave the idol worship in the hands of the people, in the hands of the priests. He himself got involved. He stood there to burn incense. In verse 2, and he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, the child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. Upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that born incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be born upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so he could not pull it in again unto him. Verse 5, the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. The sin of Jeroboam was very serious. He had become a king by the grace of God, as I told you. By the policy of deception, telling the people it was too much for them to go to Jerusalem, he made them to stay in Bethel and Dan and worship idol instead of worshiping the Lord. And already you have seen what we read in chapter 12 verse 30. This thing became a sin. That is what Jeroboam did, led the whole nation of the children of Israel apart from Judah, led them into sin. Unfortunately, his sin outlived him. Even after he died, the children of Israel continued in the sin of Jeroboam. He put it this way, it is just like a believer today, a believer that is living a righteous life. His ministry, while he's alive, may be converting souls. Even after he has died, his ministry, through the tracks and writing and whatever, may still be converting souls. In the case of Jeroboam, even after he died, his backsliding, his idol worship, was still leading people into committing sin and committing sin. He had gone to hell, while in hell, he was still an agent of Satan, and his lifestyle that he lived before he died was still leading people to hell. 
Look at the time he died in uh, 1 Kings chapter 14 verse 20. And the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers. That means he died, and Nadab his son reigned in his stead. But after his death, I want you now to see as we're going to look at references, after he died, the influence of his idol worship, of his sin over the nation Israel. Look at chapter 15, verse 25, verse 26. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, that's his son's son, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, the king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. Verse 26, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father, and, his, and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin. Every time the name of Jeroboam is mentioned, they will always add, he made Israel to sin. Chapter 15, verse 30. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned, and which he made Israel to sin. Verse 34. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin. Chapter 16, verse 26. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin, and to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Chapter 16, verse 31. And it came to pass, as if it had been enlightened for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Still, after many, many years, the sin of Jeroboam continued to influence that nation Israel. Look at chapter 22, verse 52. In chapter 22, verse 52, And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. There were some good people that rose up in the land of Israel, and many good things are written about them. But some of them, even though they might be fervent and faithful for some time, the sin of Jeroboam will make them to stumble. One such man you find in 2 Kings chapter 10 is by the name Jehu. In 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 29. Nevertheless, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Je Jehu departed not from after them. And then it says to we the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. In verse 31, but Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. You can see the pain in the heart of God. You can see the constant repetition that for many, many years that the sin that Jeroboam had committed influenced that nation and it continued and continued and continued. And then they'll mention his name and then they'll say, who made Israel to sin? That is why for a father in a home, for a mother in a home, for a leader in a society, your sin may not just stop at the time you commit that sin. It can go on and go on. In fact, it can continue to influence people negatively after you have died. A hey, pastor, the false doctrine you emphasize, the false doctrine you bring in, even after you have died, that false doctrine can continue and continue to make people backslide, continue to make them live the, um, the, the kind of a backsliding life because you have already established that false doctrine and that false practice. Even after you have died, the influence can continue. And it may not just influence one congregation, it may not just influence one tribe, it says who made Israel, a whole nation, to sin. That's why a believer should be careful in every action, in every step that he takes, because he knows that if he backslides, if he does something wrong, it may not only send him to hell, it may send multitudes of people in many generations away from God and to hell.
it may start in a very little way it's a uh, very much it's too much for them to go to jerusalem they will spend too much money going to the headquarters they will spend too much money going to bagada and they will spend too much labor joint bus to bus so why don't you stop going to bagada why don't you just stay here and we'll do whatever we can do and a little compromise to start in that way can go on like a spiral can go on and on and on to many generations and you may discover that that little thing gets into another thing and be before you know many people are backsliding away from the Lord. The little advice you give to somebody, you don't have too much money, why are you going to be spending transport money and going to the headquarters? Why don't you stay at home and read your Bible? The little advice you give to people and say, well, you know the economy now, you know the situation now, why are you going to be taking all the trouble, the danger on the road, and this one on the road, and that one on the road? Why don't you stay and uh, missing one Bible study will not spoil your Christian life? Uh, God knows you are still a Christian. God understands the condition. That little advice you give to people and say why don't you do it this way why don't you do it this way and compromise a little and make life easy for yourself that thing may not stop with that person to make him backslide can then begin to walk like the scene of Jeroboam and make others to backslide for many generations and in eternity in the record of God every time your name is mentioned they will remember the people you caused to backslide in 2nd Kings chapter 13 verse 2 and he did evil, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. You know, he still continues, just talking about Jeroboam. Every time they mention him, he made Israel to sin. In chapter 14, verse 24. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Chapter 15, verse 9. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Verse 18, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Verse 24, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. You see, there are times people go to the method or to the strategy and the policy of Jeroboam. It may be that you want to have a worker's retreat. If you are going to have a worker's retreat, you are going to leave your place of work, you are going to leave your market, and you are going to go to the IBTC and spend some time. And there may be some coordinators that will not inform all the workers and say in this economy, all these people, they are families. If they leave their place of uh, work, if they leave their market for two, three days and they go to a place saying they are having workers retreat, even the money of the registration, even everything that is going to take place, don't we know that the things are hard at this time? And because of the policy of that kind of deception, we do not tell the people, we just keep them in that ignorance and we say it is too much for them. This is not the time for workers retreat. This is not the time for Congress. This is not the time for training somewhere because the economy will not allow it. And then you say just stay there. Whatever they say there, I will come and tell you. And then you say they are burning incense with them, doing things and compromising with them and the people may not know that they are going astray it will be on your record that you are the one looking for ease you are the one not wanting them to spend money you are the one not wanting them to leave their place of work because of the economy if they backslide if they become cold if they come lukewarm it will be on your record like jeroboam you'll be the person that made those workers to backslide and the effect of your counseling will go on and on who made israel to sin eventually god rejected even the children of israel and the reason given for that is that the sin that jeroboam had established they never departed from them in second kings chapter 17 verse 20 2nd Kings chapter 17 verse 20 And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For he rent Israel from the house of David and they, and they made Jeroboam son of Nebat king and Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. And the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all the, all the servants, 
uh, the prophet so um, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. They went into captivity many, many years later when the Lord saw that they will not repent, they will not return from the scene of Jeroboam. You can tell now, you can see now how terrible the scene of Jeroboam was, how it influenced the children of Israel from generation to generation. In the passage we are studying today in 1 Kings chapter 13, God sent the prophet, the man of God, to come and warn him. Also in the following chapter, that is 1 Kings chapter 14, God sent the prophet that had prophesied originally to give him the kingdom. God sent that prophet to also warn him. In fact, Ahijah told him, because of the sin he had gotten into, he told him, I have a heavy message for you. In 1 Kings chapter 14 verse 6. 1 Kings chapter 14 verse 6. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why, why are you pretending? Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am saying to thee with heavy tidings. Was the heavy tidings? Verse 7, go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel. In verse 9, and thou hast done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and hast cast me behind thy back. In verse 10, therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam. And so you will see that the Lord warned Jeroboam. Did he repent? No, he had come to a point of no return. Chapter 13, verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way. I told you that when you look at the congregation of uh, the large church, there are people that are like Jeroboam. God gave them privilege and position. God promoted them. He gave them many things, not by merit, but by grace. But now by the, by the policy of self-management and personal decision, this is what they are going to do. They turn themselves away from the Lord and they turn other people away from the Lord. But God in his faithfulness sent to Jeroboam. That leads us to point number two. We're going to look at the faithfulness of the prophet. We're going to look at the purity of the prophet. The power of the prophet. That God sent to Jeroboam to warn him and to tell him what will really happen. So point number two, the purity and the power of a faithful prophet. Look at it again from verse one. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. Here was a prophet of the Lord, a man of God. The Lord sent him away from his own city to come to the city where Jeroboam was uh, having idol worship. He was faithful. Immediately the Lord called him and sent him there. There was no questioning. There was absolute yieldedness and surrender. He went right there to deliver the message from the Lord. That's the challenge for you and for me. That when the Lord sends us with a message to warn the unbelievers to flee from the wrath to come, we will not waste time. Immediately that message gets to us. We rise up. We go to them to warn them to flee from the judgment to come. He met Jeroboam while he stood, verse 1, by the altar to burn incense. And this man of God did not say, I will, I will tease him another time. I will not want to disturb his idol worship. I will not want to confront him at this time. I do not want to be confrontational. Right there, he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. There are times we have to confront sin. Like this man of God from Judah confronted sin. In Isaiah chapter 58, reading from verse 1 cry aloud spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of jacob their sins here you see how the prophet of the lord cried aloud against the false worship against the altar in first kings chapter 13 verse 2 and he cried against the altar in the word of the lord and said O altar altar thus says the lord Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. Upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that born incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be born upon thee. Here we see the mark of a true prophet. He is a prophet prophesied and said a child will be born. He even mentioned the name of the child that will be born that will deal with idolatry in the land. 
It took 300 years before Josiah was born. And yet, the person who named Josiah by that name, he wasn't even a believer. He wasn't a righteous king. It was Manasseh. And he, he named him Josiah without referring to the prophecy because God had said so. God fulfilled it. That shows us the inspiration of the word that came from the man of God. And you will see that he gave the word exactly as the Lord has given it to him. When you preach the word the way the Lord has given it to you and the way you are hearing in the church here, then you'll be a faithful minister of the gospel. When that man of God got there and he saw Jehoshaphat, he saw, sorry, saw Jeroboam, uh, morning the incense, the sight that he saw, the situation that he got into didn't make him afraid to change the word of God. There are some people that change the word of God once they see the facial appearance or the attitude or the comportment of the people they are preaching to. They will not be able to say, thus says the Lord, and lay it line upon line, precept upon precept. Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince against sayers. This man of God held on to the faithful word. It's a challenge to us who are believers who must be soul winners. They clear the word as the Lord has given it to us. First Kings chapter 13 verse 3. And he gave a sign the same day saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent. The ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Verse 5. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. You will see that the message of the man of God had two parts. There was a prophecy that demanded immediate fulfillment. The ashes pouring down, the altar being torn apart by the invisible supernatural hand of God. And part of the prophecy which was still to be for a long time, Josiah still to be born 300 years later. And so you'll find the one that demanded immediate fulfillment was fulfilled. The one that demanded future fulfillment was later fulfilled. What was the attitude of Jeroboam when the man of God prophesied? Look at verse 4. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it to him again that's a miracle but that is a miracle of judgment he wanted to arrest that man of god to persecute and torment that man of god this shows that god will always protect us while we're in the path of duty the hand that he put forth dried up to show us that when god has sent you to do something and you're doing nothing faithfully the protection of the lord will definitely be upon your life this is exactly what the Lord has told us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, reading from verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Fear not, but speak, hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. We're sure then that the Lord will protect us when we're in a path of duty. And then the, begin, the king began to beg. In 1 Kings chapter 13 verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again, and became as it was before. There we find another miracle. This one is a miracle of mercy. The miracle of healing, the miracle of restoration for a king that wanted to persecute the man of God. But here we see the Christian principle. To love them that hate you. To pray for them that persecute you. To do good unto them that curse you. That ye may be the children of your father. For he makes the rain and the sunshine to come upon the people that do not love him, that are not serving him, upon the just and the unjust. Some people allow persecution to take the grace of God away from their lives. 
they begin to curse their husbands who are persecuting them they begin to punish or to torment uh, the wife who is uh, persecuting them or they begin to torment or it may be the landlord or it may be the boss they begin to curse them and begin to fight with them speak violent words against them lying against them criticizing them because these landlords or these bosses in the office are persecuting them what we're learning here is that even when somebody is persecuting you and he has a problem you love him you do good unto him you pray for him you ask for the lord to do miracles of mercy for him even though he has been your persecutor there was no anger in this man of god there was no malice in this man of god there was no intention to have evil upon his enemy in this man of god you can see the holiness the righteousness the purity in his life if we are real christians and true believers the life of righteousness will point us out will show it in verse 7 the king uh, the king said unto the man of god come home with me and refresh thyself and i will give thee a reward and the man of god said unto the king if thou wilt give me up of thine house i will not go in with thee neither will i eat bread nor drink water in this place for so it was charged me by the word of the lord saying eat no bread drink no water nor turn again by the way that thou camest so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to bethel here we see something very important today this man of god knew that you are not so supposed to sell miracle or supposed to sell prayer he had prayed a miracle had taken place the king said come on with me so you can eat and refresh yourself and i will give you some money i'll give you some reward here is where the people that are not standing firm on the word of god here is a place they fail in fact before the king offers anything they'll begin to beg i remember the prayer warriors you remember when i prayed for you and you were delivered you remember when i prayed for you and i even fasted and you were healed I am preparing for my marriage now. What are you going to help me? I don't have my money. Dowry is not complete. I am a prophet of God. You will remember the child you are carrying now. I was the one that prayed and now you have got that child. I'm surprised that even at the naming ceremony, you didn't even remember a bottle of coke to send to the man that prayed for the child to come. And uh, you know what I've been doing for you? I've been, you know, miracles in your life and the many, many things God has used me to do in your life. I'm looking for capital now to establish a business so that uh, because man will eat, you know, the condition in which we are now. Uh, from what I've done to you, even if it is only 50,000 naira, you can help me. The miracle you got is that not more than 50,000 naira. These people, they begin to beg for money they begin to beg for material things on the basis that they are paid for people and see what god had done we don't sell miracle we don't sell prayer after naaman was healed he begged and pleaded that elisha will take something elisha said no i will not take anything we don't sell prayer we don't sell miracle this is what the lord jesus christ later told the disciples in matthew chapter 10 reading from verses 7 and 8 as he go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead cast out devils after you have done that remember freely you have received freely give in third john verse seven third john verse seven because for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the gentiles when we go out in evangelism or the crusade we don't collect offering from the sinners on the crusade field when we go to the village to plant a church or to raise up the church to evangelize we don't take money from the villagers when in our community a highly placed man a governor an administrator a doctor a highly placed uh, personality he calls us his child is sick or something is happening there and we minister to them bring them to the lord and pray for them we don't take money now we go to point number three and very quickly we're going to go through this we're looking at it from verse 11 of first kings chapter 13 now there dwelt an old prophet in bethel and his son came and told him all the works that the man of god had done that day in bethel the words which he had spoken unto the king them they told also to their father and their father said unto them what way went he for he, his son had seen what way when the man of god uh, which came from judah and he said to this to his son saddle me the ass so they saddled him the ass and he rode thereon and he went after the man of god and found him sitting under an oak and he said unto him are thou the man of god that came from judah and he said i am 
Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt not eat bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way thou camest. He said unto him, I'm a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Here we find something very shocking and very disturbing. There had been an old prophet in that place. And this old prophet had known about all the idolatry going on and he never raised his voice to challenge the idolatry in the place. In fact, the sons of this old prophet were at the place where the idol was being worshipped. The old prophet and his sons had become part of the system of idol worship in that place. When his uh, sons came back and told him what had happened, he said, Do you know the way that that man of God took? And they said, Yes, we saw him when he was going. And so he said, saddle the ass for me so I can follow after him. And unfortunately, the man of God was resting by the way. A little sin can lead to a greater sin. Now, here we need to take a note of the life of the believer. After a great triumph, there may be a great temptation. After we have got a great victory, there we can become a victim to the lies of the old prophet. Whenever you have done something for the Lord, if you begin to slow down and you begin to rest and say, well, since I became born again, even the other believers, they have not done as much as I have done. And then you rest by the way. That resting in itself may not be a sin, but it may attract some, uh, uh, some terrible sin upon your life. Sometimes there is a temptation to rest. And uh, the devil will be discussing with us, is it a sin to rest? All that you have done in Bethel, the challenge you have given to the king, the forceful way in which you have preached, the sign that you have given, and the way you have been faithful to reject the offer of the king. There is nobody that has been as faithful as you are in that place. They know that you are a special man of God, a special prophet of God. So he waited by under that tree and he was resting. He wasn't drinking beer there. He wasn't smoking cigarette there. He wasn't committing fornication there. He was just resting his body which is normal, which is legitimate. But there are wrong places to rest. There are wrong times to rest. And so while he was resting there, this old prophet met him there. If you keep on moving, the devil will not meet you. If you keep on moving, the false prophets will not catch up on you. And so the man met him there. He said, are you the young prophet that came? Oh, he said, yes, I am. I said, don't you know that uh, you are not the only one serving the Lord? I'm there in that city. You didn't even check up on me. Now, come back. And the man said, I cannot go back because of the word of the Lord. Ah, are you the only one that have the word of the Lord? Uh, you heard from the Lord? Why do you think I came to you now? An angel appeared to me. And that angel said, you must change your conviction. Forget what God has told you. We have got the word of an angel. He lied unto him. There are many liars and deceivers today that will tell us what revelation they have seen. They tell us that their dreams are stronger and greater than the doctrine of the Bible. They tell us that angels can change the word of God. They tell us there is a new doctrine, there is a new method. They tell us we should come back to the thing we rejected. The king told us to take it, we rejected it. They said, I am telling you now, you have rejected it from the king. An angel appeared unto me, come and take that same thing. The thing we rejected earlier in our Christian lives. The things we stood upon, the thing we took a stand upon when we were first Christians. Some people are coming with vision and revelation. They are telling us that don't be that strong. Don't be that under that conviction. Change that thing. An angel has appeared to me. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. Galatians 1 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It may be an angel from heaven, may be an angel from anywhere. If he preaches anything different from this sound doctrine, let him be a cur. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 
And uh, so they make they deceive the soul. We, we, we too, we are standing on the same thing. You mentioned salvation, they say, Yes, I believe it too. You mentioned sanctification, they say, Yes, that's what we are preaching to. You mentioned legal baptism, are they saying, In fact, we also speak in tongues. Uh, they say, One man, one, uh, one woman, and uh, they say, Well, that's the word of God. We believe it too. Well, we believe in evangelism. We want to serve the Lord. I've committed my life. Or they said exactly. In fact, we are just the same. And yet, it is a lie. And so this old prophet came to the young prophet and said, Here we are. Come back with me. What you are telling me, I understand. But an angel appeared unto me to bring you back. They will come to you. They will talk to you. They will tell you of revelation. They will give you testimonies. They will tell you what is happening on the other side of the fence. They will tell you of revelations and dreams and power. And it was after all, you are not backsliding. Uh, are you living Christ? That you live deeper life does not does that mean that you are living Christ? Am I telling you to throw away your Bible? Am I telling you not to pray? Am I telling you not to live a righteous life? I the old prophet said, I'm not telling you to go to the king. I said, I am a prophet like you are. Come with me. This is fellowship of prophet to prophet. Proverbs chapter 26 and in verse 25. Proverbs 26, 25. Where he speaketh fear, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Whatever he's telling you, whatever he's wanting you to do to change your conviction, to change the doctrine, to come aside and to go the wrong way, don't believe him. He may talk nice, he may talk sweet, he may talk well. There are seven abominations in his heart. Unfortunately, the young prophet went back with him. You know something that we see here? The old prophet failed to convert Jeroboam, but he succeeded in making a faithful man to backslide. You know what I discovered today? The people that, that, that backslide, the people that leave the fold, the people that are now living on lying and deception, they cannot do evangelism to the sinners outside. They cannot convert the Jeroboam's outside. It is the faithful people who are standing. It is the faithful people who are already born again, who are sanctified, who are working for the Lord here. They'll be going to their houses to lie to them, to take them away out of the fold into evil. They cannot convert the Jeroboam's outside. They want to make the people inside the kingdom of God to backslide. If you listen to them, it's because you want to perish. Let us look at the end of this young prophet. When I read this, I tremble. When I read what happened to the young prophet, it makes me to fear God that whatever good thing you have done in the past, whatever faithfulness of the past, whatever steadfastness of the past, whatever holiness of the past, whatever authority in prayer you had in the past, whatever knowledge of sound doctrine you had in the past, that you have been standing faithfully and you reject money from the king, you reject food from the king and you stayed on the word of God in the past. If you allow the old prophet to deceive you and to take you back, let us see what happened. In 1 uh, Kings chapter 13, re reading from verse 20, and it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten, hast eaten bread, and drunk water in this place, of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. The same prophet that brought him back. The same prophet that deceived him. The same prophet that lied unto him. As they sat on the table. This man just received the word from the Lord. That may surprise you. But that was saying God could not talk to that young prophet again. He will prefer to talk through the backslider, through the liar, through the sinner, rather than talk to this young prophet. It means the Lord abandoned that young prophet. The Lord rejected him. He said, although judgment is coming, I will not even talk directly to you. I will talk to the deceiver. You have become worse than the believer. You see in your life, when you have been faithful, when you have been following the Lord, and you have been in good intimate relationship with the Lord, he had been talking to you now you do something that you know very clearly very plainly he doesn't want you to do you can come to the point he abandons you and he will rather speak to the deceiver the sinner the backslider than speak to you 
in verse 24 and when he was gone a lion met him by the way uh -uh. look at this young prophet when he was there on the table and the word of god came sharply to him why didn't he drop the food and drop the water and fall on his knees and begin to cry unto the lord and say god i know that i've done wrong did wasn't he a prophet of god didn't he know that god is a merciful god didn't he know that god can answer prayer didn't he know that god will not be angry forever why didn't he cry unto the lord Nineveh cried unto the lord when jonah said 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown and the king said to all the people cry mightily unto the lord and the lord had mercy on them when they repented of their evil but this man the food in the house of the old prophet sealed his heart hardened his heart deafened his ears closed his eyes he couldn't see he couldn't understand he was completely dull of hearing now he couldn't even fall on his knees and say oh god have mercy on me spare my life forgive me he couldn't pray have you got to that point where god is talking to you where god is warning you where the message is coming to you very sharp like an arrow into your heart and you see down there the sin is still there the backsliding is there you see that judgment is coming like this you will not even cry unto the lord and say lord i know i've gone astray i know i've done something wrong have mercy upon me tonight are we just going to remain there with all the warnings of god are we just going to remain there with all the sins we have committed are we just going to remain there with all the compromises going here going there going there and the warning of god is coming are we not going to cry unto the lord like me never cry if you if you're counting a lot today the Lord is still able to have mercy. He says, I'm not willing that you should perish. But he says, turn from all your evil ways. Why will ye die, O house of Israel? I challenge you all here tonight. Every man, every woman. Why will you die? Oh, the man did not drink beer. The man did not drink any eat ordinary food, ordinary food, ordinary water. Are you going to go to hell because of ordinary jewelry, ordinary powder, ordinary cosmetic, ordinary palming, ordinary slags, ordinary dressing, ordinary naira, ordinary whatever it is, or bread or water or whatever it is. Rise up and call upon the Lord thy God that you will not perish because of these little, little things, because of money, because of the six in the world. As the Lord is calling you and warning you, saying, Where are you going to die? Come back to the Lord and repent today. Will you allow bread and butter to take you to hell? Ordinary water to take you to hell? Ordinary jewelry to take you to hell? Ordinary painting pami to take you to hell? Uh -huh. They say it's a little thing, it's a little thing. The, the bread was a little thing. The water was a little thing. Saying standing by city by the way was a little thing. Coming back to where the old prophet was a little thing. Sitting in the house of the old prophet was a little thing. It was a little compromise. He didn't worship idol. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't commit fornication. He didn't commit abortion. It was a little thing. And the little thing made the Lord to come upon him and to, and to snatch him away and to tear him to pieces. Hey, has the old prophet deceived you? Has the old prophet brought you back? Or are you calling upon the Lord today? Have mercy upon me. Don't let me die the death of a backslider. Have mercy upon me. Don't let me die the death of a sinner. Have mercy upon me. Don't let me die the death of somebody standing by the wayside. Have mercy upon me. Don't let the water and the bread in the Anona Trust land take me to hell. The Lord is pleading with you. Why will you die? Why will you die? Why will you die? Why will you die? Why don't you say, God have mercy upon me? I will not compromise again. I will not backslide again. I will hold on to the truth of the word of God. An angel may come, I will not listen. A false prophet may come, and I will not listen. The old prophet may come, I will not listen. I surrender to the Lord today. Whatever the Lord tells me not to do, I will not do. I will not allow these old prophets, these backsliders to deceive me and to take me to hell. There is still mercy today. 
Are you there? You cannot pray. Are you there? You cannot cry. Are you there? You cannot talk to the Lord. Are you there like that young prophet? He should have called upon the Lord right there. He should have pleaded for mercy right there. But he finished that food, he finished that water, then he got up, he died for it. The Lord has warned you, if you die in sin, you don't have any excuse. 